Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his powerful series this month called Believe and See. Do you need God to move dramatically in your life? Today, you'll learn exactly how to see the glory of God. So to kick off this series, Believe and See, and this theme, we want to be in John chapter 11, where Jesus said those words, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And we want to ask this question, are you willing to do what it takes to see God's glory? John chapter 11 sets the stage this way, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The, the sisters therefore sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And he's deathly sick, as we are going to learn from the story. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Hey, are you willing to do what it takes to see the glory of God? Because in John chapter 11, we find out the requirements that are needed in order to see the glory of God. Requirement number one, start viewing your problems in a different way. If you want to see God show up and show out, if you want to see God do great and mighty things in your life, not just in other people's lives, not just uh, for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, not just for the people we read about in the Bible, not just for uh, somebody you hear about at church, not just for uh, the, the, the testimonies that you might see on television. In your life, if you want to see him do great things in your life, start viewing your problems in a different way. Now, when it comes to problems, everybody's got them. You got them, I got them, Adam had them. Everybody has problems. Man who is born of woman, the Scripture says in the book of Job, is short-lived and full of trouble. Well, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they all lived together. They're siblings, and they were very close to the Lord Jesus. He would come. They no doubt supported his ministry. They were personal friends of his. You know, Jesus loves everybody, but he didn't go to everybody's home per se, but he would go to their home, and we read about him having a meal in uh, their home in Luke chapter 10. They were special to him. So it says, Lazarus, Jesus, whom you love, he is sick. And Mary and Martha sent the message to Jesus that Lazarus, our brother, is sick, very, very sick, and he needs you. That was obviously embedded in the message. He needs you. So what do you do when you have a problem? What do you do when you have trouble? You do what they did. You bring your problem, bring your troubles to Jesus. The Bible says in Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. And so we got to start bringing our problems to Jesus. You say, well, yeah, no kidding. You went to seminary for that? I mean, everybody knows that. How is that viewing my problems differently? Ah, because when you bring your problems to Jesus, just like they did, then you know that your problems are opportunities in disguise. That's what's different. We look at our problems as this is a big problem. I hate this problem. I don't want this problem. Oh, God, deliver me from this problem. Oh, God, change the situation. Change the circumstances. I need you to do it now, Lord. But Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 4, when he heard the news, it says, when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Oh, this, this sickness, this is a bad sickness, Lord, but it's not a bad thing. 
Because it's not unto death, it's for the glory of God. That the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, might be glorified by it. Well, that's a whole different way to look at it. And your problem, no matter what it is, no matter how huge it is, it's an opportunity for the Son of God to be glorified by it. You know, Paul had a big problem, big problem. He talks about it. It was his thorn in the flesh. He didn't want it. We don't know exactly what it was, but he did not want it. It was painful, and it caused him problems, whether it was a physical uh, situation. Uh, some have said he had uh, problems with malaria and these terrible headaches. Others have said it was his eyesight and he couldn't see. Others have said it was the persecution that he experienced from the Judaizers. We're not sure what it was. But we know that he didn't want it, and he prayed three times, Lord, take this thorn from me. And the Lord said, no. No. He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. And all of a sudden, when the Lord said that to Paul, the light went off in his, or the light went on in his mind, and he was like, wow, this is a good thing. I thought this was a bad thing, but this is a good thing. And he said, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Start viewing your problems from a different perspective. Start seeing that your problems, no matter how great, no matter how big, it's just an opportunity for God to showcase his glory. And the Lord is the one who specializes in the resurrection. He specializes in miracles. So that's the very first requirement. I'm going to start to view my problems in a different way. Second requirement, start clinging to the promises of God no matter what. No matter what. Now, here's the news. It comes to Jesus. Jesus is in Perea. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they live in Bethany, which is about two miles from Jerusalem. Jesus in John chapter 10 had to leave Jerusalem because they were picking up stones to stone him. Jesus said, why are you stoning me? They said, for a good work we stone you not, but because you being a man make yourself out to be God. That's why we're stoning you. Or they were going to stone him. He slipped away. But don't go back to Judea because it's dangerous there for Jesus. So he went to Perea, probably where uh, kind of where John the Baptist was baptizing at one time. And so he's a distance from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, like I said, it's only about two miles. Bethany's only two miles from Jerusalem. And Bethany was where Lazarus is. So he gets the news. Hey, you need to come. That's, that's the emphasis. You need to come quickly because the one whom you love is sick. Verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, verse 6, he stayed then two days longer in the place where he was. Well, no, Lord, we don't need to stay longer. We need to hustle up. But he purposely stayed longer. And then he told the guys, hey, we need to go to to Judea again. And they're like, man, Lord, we don't want to go to Judea. They were just seeking to kill you. We're not supposed to go there. And Jesus said to the guys, he said, hey, guys, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. They're like, big whoop, he's fallen asleep? I mean, he'll wake up. And and he said, no, you're you're not getting it. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. But now let's go. And Thomas, you know, we give Thomas a bad rap. We call him the doubting Thomas. Thomas was the one who stood up among the 12 and said, let's go with him and die with him. He thought for sure if they go back to Judea, if they go around Jerusalem, that they're going to be, they're going to kill Jesus and and Thomas and the other guys are going to die just guilt by association. They're going to die too. And so he was willing to go to Jerusalem or to Judea with Jesus, and even though he thought they might be killed as a result. And it says in verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. The Jews would bury quickly after you died because they didn't embalm. And so they would get you in the tomb quickly because decay would set in. It says, now Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, and Mary still sat in the house. Martha, therefore, said to Jesus, Lord, 
if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's true. Could you imagine Jesus being there and Lazarus dies? That wouldn't have happened. Jesus is the one who heals the sick. He opens blind eyes. He feeds the multitudes with a little kid's lunch. That's not going to happen. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's a true statement, but it might have been said almost a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of barb there because there's hurt, because, Lord, where were you? And she says in verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Now, the Lord had given her a promise in verse 4. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God should be glorified by it. Okay? But he died. And so you couldn't wrap your head around that. It's like uh, he died, and, and your brother shall rise again. That's what Jesus said when he came four days later. Your brother shall rise again. Well, Martha's saying, well, yeah, I know, I believe in the last day he's going to rise. No, not on the last day, today. Today he's going to rise. She didn't get any of that because she didn't have the rest of the story. You know, we see the story from the beginning to the end. They didn't. They're living it. And so they don't know what's happening. All they know is Lazarus is dead and Jesus wasn't here. And if he had been here, Lazarus wouldn't be dead. But Jesus gave a promise, and his promise doesn't seem to fit at all because the, the sickness wasn't unto death, but he died. Start clinging to the promises of God no matter what. Now, remember this about the promises of God. God's promises are often misunderstood but they're never false. They're never empty. They're never just words that don't come true. God doesn't ever give a promise and it falls flat. But we often misunderstand God's promises. And let me tell you, that is why so many people get mad at God and bitter at God is because something comes into their lives. Some big Lazarus is sick kind of situation comes into their lives. A big problem, not a little problem, not I lost my keys, but I lost my job. I lost my spouse. I lost my child to death. A big problem comes into life, and they look to the Word of God, and they find a promise from the Word of God, and they think that God is supposed to act a certain way and do something specifically for them, and they put specifics on a general promise, and then the specifics don't come to pass, and then they get mad at God. And then they start to think, they wouldn't say this out loud, but they start to think that God doesn't tell the truth, that God is a welcher on His promises. Know this. God's timing is almost always later than our timing. God's timing. He, his ways are different from our ways. His timing's different from our timing. And so when we want God to do something, we want him to do it just then. You know, no doubt, Mary and Martha, when they sent the servant to tell Jesus that y- your servant Lazarus, your friend Lazarus is sick, they wanted Jesus to speak a word and heal him right then because he's really, really sick. He dies the same day because Jesus stayed two more days, took him another day to travel to get there. He died the day that the messenger came. But see, Jesus can heal from distance. We already learned that in John chapter 4. He heals a nobleman's son just with his word. It just says, told, told the nobleman, go your way, your servant is healed. He didn't have to go there. He could just speak the word, and it happened. And so Mary and Martha knew that. They're like, we just need a word from you, Jesus, to bring healing. But he didn't do it that way. He doesn't operate on our timetable. He doesn't do things the way we think he ought to do them. He's God, and you and I are like ants compared to God. And so we just say, yes, Lord. And when he gives us a promise, we cling to the promise no matter what, no matter what the circumstances say. And what's the faith response from Mary and Martha? This doesn't make any sense at all, Lord, but... You told me this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, and I'm clinging to that. I'm clinging to that. 
I don't know all, what all it means, but I'm clinging to that. God's time, always later. I said almost always. You could probably cut out almost. I can't think of an instance where, when it's not later. God calls Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. When did he give him a son? 30 years later. The son of Sarah, his wife. 30 years later. Abraham, he didn't ever say Abraham's going to be 30 years. God calls and anoints David king. He's probably 12 years old. When did David become king of all Israel's? 37. 37. 25 years later, God says to Joseph, gives him a dream. Your brothers are going to bow down to you. When did they bow down to him? 22 years later. So when God gives a promise, when he gives a word, uh, it, it's, we, he doesn't put a time frame on it. We like to put a time frame. We like to say that's happening now. And so much of the time it's not, and we get frustrated with God and, and disenchanted by God because we say, God, you haven't come through. And God says, not yet, not yet. You just hold your horses. That's what he said to Moses. That's what he said to Mary and Martha. That's what he says to us. Start clinging to the promises of God no matter what. Requirement number three, start obeying the word of God even if it makes no sense. So Jesus has that encounter with Martha, and then he has an encounter with Mary. And Mary, she's the one who sat at his feet listening to his word in Luke chapter 10. Martha, I think, is probably the, the oldest one in the family. I think Mary is the youngest one in the family. Lazarus probably in the middle. The tradition says Lazarus was 30 years old when Jesus raised him from the dead, and he died when he was 60. That's what tradition says tells us. But here you have, Martha is naturally bossy. You know, in Luke chapter 10, she came into Jesus when Mary was sitting at his feet. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving by herself? Then tell her to help me. Never a good plan to tell Jesus what he ought to do. Never a good plan. Don't do that. Don't follow in her footsteps. But she's just naturally kind of a, a bossy person. So she comes to Jesus first, then Mary comes and Mary says the exact same thing that Martha said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that's true. That's just true. And so Jesus, we read that he was so moved that he, at the, the death of Lazarus and just death in general and, and what that meant and, and the people that he loved were so upset that he wept. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. And then he, the people were saying, couldn't this man who, who did all these miracles, who opened the eyes of the blind, who cleansed the leper, couldn't this man have kept Lazarus from dying? Sure he could. He did it on purpose. He came late on purpose. And so when he comes, it says in verse 38, Jesus, therefore, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now, it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And they removed the stone. He comes, and he says, roll away the stone, remove the stone. And she doesn't want to do it. Why? Because of the smell. Because of the smell. See, he, he, it takes faith. And if you don't have faith, then the Lord's not going to work. And your faith is evidenced by action. Remove the stone. Start obeying the Word of God, even if it makes, makes no sense. And requirement number four, start living with expectation in your heart. John 11 41. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. The greatest miracle 
Jesus ever performed outside of his own resurrection was the resurrection of dead, decaying Lazarus. Greatest miracle. John has seven miracles in the Gospel of John. He starts with the uh, miracle at Cana of Galilee, turning the water into wine, and he ends up with this one, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Four days on purpose. Jesus waited two extra days on purpose. Why? So that the Son of God would be glorified by it. Now, if Jesus had healed Lazarus from a distance, man, that's awesome. That's great. That goes along with so many of the other miracles that he performed. Everybody would be talking about it. It would be really cool. Hey, he just spoke a word. Well, maybe, maybe it was just coincidental. Maybe Lazarus was getting better on his own. We just didn't know it. But you let Lazarus die, and you wrap him up like a, you know, as they did, almost like a mummy. You know, he's just all wrapped up. And you stick him in the tomb, and you let him rot and decompose and start to stink. He's completely dead. Everybody knows it. And Jesus raises him from the dead, and everybody says, wow. How, how does this happen? How can this be this man must be the Son of God. Amen. And many people believed on him. And the Pharisees heard about it, and they plotted for his death because they said, this man is going to take away our place, and we cannot have that happen. It's the spirit of religion. Religion is all concerned about turf. People who see their need they're not concerned about religion. They're not concerned about turf. They're concerned about having an encounter with God. You know, when, when those disciples were on the stormy sea of Galilee in Mark chapter 4, and Jesus was asleep in the boat, and they woke him up, and they said, Teacher, uh, do you not care that we are perishing? And he calmed the sea and said, Hush, be still, and it became perfectly calm. And they said this, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey his voice? Wow! This must be God. And they knew that day in Bethany, this is the one that God has sent. This is the Son of God. This is God, the Son. And he can do anything in anyone's life if they'll believe him and roll away the stone. I love what David said in Psalm 27, verse 13. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord because the Lord can do anything. Now, here is the interesting point that the Lord just kind of dropped in my heart. John 11, verse 40 is a question. Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? It's a question. Well, yes, Lord, you said that to me. What is your answer to the Lord? He asks you a question. He says, remove the stone. Oh, Lord, I don't know if I want to do that. Take that step of faith. Oh, Lord, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He's calling some of you. He's saying, you know, you've been visiting the church for a long time. You need to take a step of faith and join the church. Oh, I don't know about that. You, you, you saw Jackie Sullivan get baptized. He had gotten baptized when he was younger, but he got saved later, and so he needed to get baptized to make it right. And he took that step of faith, and you say, well, I, boy, I don't know about that. If I could take that step of faith. Hey, remove the stone, whatever the stone is. And if you don't remove the stone, you're not going to see the glory of God. So the question comes to you and to me. Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And if you believe, you'll take a step of faith. And if you take a step of faith, if you step up and step out, God will show up and show out because that's what's promised in the Word of God. My friend, now is the time to do business with God. If you're watching and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, this is what I want you to do. Just pray and say, Lord, I want to know you in a real and personal way. 
I don't want to know about you. I want to have a personal relationship with you. Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now I surrender my heart, my life to you. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender myself to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Today's message, How to See the Glory of God, is available in multiple formats when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Jesus said, you must believe first in order to see. A step of faith is required to see a move of God. This month, Pastor Jeff Shreve is in his powerful series, Believe and See, designed to teach spiritual truths to strengthen and encourage your faith. We'd like you to have a copy in the format of your choice as our thanks for your support this month. And with that gift, we'll also send you Pastor Jeff's inspiring booklet, The Divine Helper, Uncovering the Mystery of the Holy Spirit. Make your gift today by calling 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org and request Believe and See and The Divine Helper. And thank you for extending your influence for Christ around the world through From His Heart. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org.